Okay, hello and welcome. Um, tonight is our last lecture in the 2008 uh, lecture, Sliver Lecture Series, Information Obsession. Following the lecture, we will move to the gallery for the reception of the Recycled Toy and Furniture Prototype show below. Tonight, it is my true honor to introduce a familiar face and presence to most of us here, Professor Greg Lim. Greg brings a unique combination of expertise to the field of architecture, ranging from fantastical speculative projects to the development of new construction techniques and design applications. He's graduated from Miami University of Ohio with a degree in architecture and philosophy, and then went on to earn his master's in architecture from Princeton University. He leveraged the timing of his education and a clear ambition to assert himself as a leader within the field of digital design, writing and illustrating eloquently that the computer could and should be used in the generation of architecture, not just as a service to it. While the debate and critique runs deep regarding Greg's work, highly recognized critics such as the late Herbert Mouchamp and Richard Weinstein have set forth that he is one of the most influential form makers of his generation, and that he has understood and pioneered the most important shift in architecture since the Renaissance. These are not light statements, but Greg takes these substantial comments and takes them in stride. In parallel to his architectural practice, he has taught and lectured around the world, provoking academic environments at such no notable institutions as Columbia University, UCLA, and Yale, and of course here at the Agnavanta. I believe that it is no coincidence that all of these schools underwent critical pedagogical shifts during his tenure there. He is a stimulus for innovation and development, constantly setting the bar higher and provoking the status quo, asking the questions that presently challenge our profession. Recently, when talking about Greg with one of his peers, it was remarked that Greg just knows how to keep it fresh. This observation is closely related to his uncanny ability to develop new ways of solving problems inventing and appropriating tools from adjacent fields. For Greg, design is a true lifestyle. As far as I can tell, he does not distinguish between what is happening within his studio, around the dinner table, within his office, or on his sailboat, all environments that are very rich in inspiration. His architectural designs have received numerous awards, far too many to say here tonight, and have been exhibited in both architecture and art museums, but most notably, or most recently, the 2008 Venice Biennale of Architecture, where he was awarded the Golden Lion for the best installation project. But even more important to all the awards is what they represent. Greg is a nexus. He connects, in no particular order, architectural practice, academia, the manufacturing industry, the art world, and of course, effortly bridges between the generations. In the words of Wolf Pricks, words are cheap. And in the case of Greg, he demonstrates again and again through the use of refined design sensibility and advanced technological advancements, applicable techniques that can be employed to produce a range of effects and challenge conventions. There is no doubt that he is a leader in the field, the ones other watch, others watch for know-how. In some of his recent projects, such as the blob wall and toy furniture, Greg poses questions. Why do bricks have to be hard, heavy, and red? Can we stack them in other ways? Can they be lighter, brighter, and more playful? For Greg, fascinations become very productive. Watch out, plastic. You're in for a great ride. since I've given a lecture here. So I just assumed that I gave a lecture here like last month. So I stripped everything out of the lecture and thought I would talk about um, plastics because we, Christy and Alex, were able to get the toy furniture over here. I thought I would talk about what it is to think about plastics, and I brought some examples, a lot of examples of plastics, and I want to, you know, expand the notion of plastic from just the material to um, 
a concept of plasticity in form making. And I think it would be, you know, important to say that as a material in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, it was assumed that plastic had no intrinsic material qualities. So um, plasticity was a very key term for people like Wolflin writing about the Baroque and Mannerist architecture, distinguishing between them exactly on this issue of plasticity. And here plasticity meant the continuity between surfaces, the malleability of surfaces, the integration of ornament and transitional elements between surfaces. Um, but plasticity was a, a term which was associated with form and construction and was moving towards a definition of, of surfaces behaving volumetrically. Um, in the 50s and 60s, when the material plastics started to emerge, there was an assumption that plastics had no innate qualities. So you would use plastic to simulate wood, or you might use plastic to simulate stone. Um, and in fact, when I started working with the Warner Brothers scene shop doing large-scale vacuforming, what they were doing was vacuforming bricks and having painters paint the bricks and using them for lightweight backdrops and set design. So plastics has really been thought of as a, as a material without intrinsic character. Um, my wife, Sylvia Laven, on the other hand, sees a piece of orange, shiny plastic from the 1970s and gets this kind of like soft look in her eyes. And I realize that, in fact, for people born in the 60s and 70s, plastics does have an innate form, and it does have a, a kind of contemporaneity to it. So anyway, um, this I just ran through and, and tried to go back. This is like 15 years ago um, when I started working with animation software, and you can see this image of a, a real early particle animation, as well as some uh, Darcy Wentworth Thompson transformations of grids, plastically, like the plastic transformation of grids, the Hans Jenny studies of um, magnetic clays on a vibrating surface, the early studies of the blob modeling software. Um, there was a kind, there was an, in, I had an interest in formal plasticity and transformation, they always have had it, never would have put the term plastic on it. Um, and at the same time, I remember finding the stereolithography machines at the New Jersey Institute of Technology and using these stereolithography machines to print plastic, translucent plastic models. And, you know, seeing that and, and a series of exhibitions like the Henny Onstead Kunst Center, um, installation in Oslo, which we skinned in bubble wrap, like the little popping bubbles. Um, the Artist Space Show, which we did in Sintra and Lexan. You know, I've always used and thought about plastics um, as a construction material and as a, a kind of liquid transformational geometry. Um, more recently in the Intricacy Show at the Institute for Contemporary Arts in Philadelphia, um, I built these fiberglass lights, which was the first time I ever uh, built something using a composite material, but we used a translucent fiberglass that we lit from below. Um, as well as I curated a, a group of objects, David Reed's paintings, which are literally three-dimensional plastic paintings that get sanded down. Um, Roxy Payne's blob studies, which are the white kind of splatters, and then the skumax, which are, um, Roxy takes a, a nozzle that dispenses plastic polymer that's like paint, and will do a sketch of, um, on, a, on a computer, and the sketch is, the curve of the sketch is showing how quickly it's gonna extrude the mass of plastic. So it squirts this plastic out in a couple of minutes. 
but depending on how he draws a curve, it'll squirt out more plastic at one time and slow down. And so based on how quickly it gets um, pumped out of this head, it'll slump and fall over and make these kinds of patterns. So every skumac has the same quantity of material, but every one's a little bit different because of this doodle he does that extrudes them. Um, but so that plastic material, the packing peanuts of Tom Friedman, um, I, I had the idea for the recycled toy furniture around the time of the Intricacy Show. Um, it wasn't like I, you know, the one thing followed the other, but when I did the Intricacy Show, my kids were two and four years old and my house was starting to get filled with big plastic toys. Um, and it was at that time that I got this Tom Friedman packing peanut piece in the show, which is a series of little plastic peanuts that are all glue gunned together to make a cube, kind of porous cube. And I put off a style in the show and had made an argument about a kind of intricacy that used modular elements in a non-modular way. And so somewhere between the big pieces of plastic toys in the house, the Tom Friedman stacking of the peanuts and office saw, it's where I had the idea to scan and can recycle these big hollow bricks. Um, but anyway, again, it went to plastics. Um, you know, the Chris Cunningham robot. So I tried to go through and categorize some of the things that I associate with plastic construction. Um, I think the first is the repetition and fusion of similar elements. As far back as I could go to find that was this competition entry for the Cardiff Bay Opera House, um, which took a figure and deformed the figure and fused it together into a single surface. Um, but again, it's that repetition and fusion that I associate with classics. And maybe one of the latest things, this um, is a wall, a storage wall that we built at uh, the Vitra Design Museum of intersecting plastic spheres mounted on circular mirrors to generate a new kind of window into the space. One of the other things I associate with plastics is surface, and this is a kind of Wolflin uh, approach to plastic form, where it's a voluptuousness or curvature. It's about surfaces, shells, skins, um, unifying elements as surfaces rather than as components or parts. Um, you know, here's an, another view of that Vitra exhibition. Um, but the idea of taking components and transforming them into shells and surfaces that undulate is another characteristic of plastics. Um, I think this will be self-explanatory if I just play the movie. For that exhibition in Basel, we, uh, um, living in Los Angeles, you get to know a lot of people who work in the movie industry. I happen to be very friendly with the pre-visualization person for the Transformers. And so I was asked to do a domestic interior in the Vitra showroom, and I said, well, I'll do the ravioli chairs, but I'd like to do it for a robot family. And so, um, a little feature movie. I'll torture you with the whole thing. But, um, it is interesting that so, so many people from architecture are working in industries like pre-visualization where what um, this company does is take uh, scenes and characters, figure out how they're going to move and interact, figure out how renderings are going to work with live action scenes, and show this stuff to the actors and directors, and then they'll shoot a scene, and then they'll go back and rotoscope uh, the actual pre-visualization to match it. So anyway, we, we didn't literally use any of the Transformers that would have been illegal so but you know basically we did all the motion capture in some cases there were people in suits with dots like leotards with dots getting motion captured moving around and in other cases they were actually just animating these things okay but so if anybody was there that in the room there was a uh, 
there were the bubble cabinets with my collection of plastic toy robots, which I forgot to bring, but I've got this very extensive, you know, several hundred plastic robots from the 1970s and 80s that we put on exhibition there. And there was also a, a monitor that had this movie playing in the room. As if there's kind of like the ghost room of these Transformer robots. Okay, so um, the kind of pop and lock motion, uh, which I also, I mean, a lot of this is autobiographical, but that, that plastic view of motion and animation is also something that I think tempers the lava lamp look of some of those early animations. Okay, so to try to put some of this together into architectural principles, um, for me, I've gotten more and more interested in a kind of minimalism. And I can show you an example of how that works architecturally, but it really first came to me working on this feature chair. And for me, minimalism isn't the, the in the 70s, there were a lot of artists that started to work in architectural territory. And people like uh, Saul LeWitt and Peter Eisenman and Richard Serra and Frank Gehry, you know, people who were working on the same thing from different uh, disciplines, ended up having a lot of tension over who understood the formal principles more correctly. And there's been a lot of uh, architects trying to bring some of that language back into our field. So when I say minimalism, I don't mean like, you know, Pawson or Chipperfield or somebody like that. Um, what I mean is using surfaces and a plastic formal language to integrate which were previously disparate elements. Um, the first thing where I did that was this uh, Visionaire magazine case. And Visionaire magazine does a magazine which they edit with the Fashion House. And then the Fashion House gives them about half a million dollars to do customized cases. And so they asked me to do a case um, along with the designer for Dior Homme, Hedy Slimane. And so I got on a telephone call uh, to talk about what to do with the case and Hedy said, um, <coughs> You know, I love your work, you're so visionary, I really want you to have a lot of fun with this, and really want you to express yourself, and there's just a few little ideas I have. One is that it has to be a rectangle of exactly these dimensions. It should be in cool gray number two, and you can't see any hinges or clasps or points of attachment at all. Uh, and the only thing I want is a debossed, Visionaire number 34 Paris, you know, on the outside of it. And he says, but other than that, I want you to like go crazy. So I, I thought, well, instead of pushing back, let, let's just try to do the hinges and the clasps and the support for the book with this kind of clamshell. So we took two uh, C-shaped break form aluminum panels and designed this rippling plastic insert and the magazine kind of rests on the waves of this plastic base and then the edges of the plastic base are like teeth that bite together and interlock the magazine case together. So these two halves can only be attached or lifted if you lift them up absolutely vertically but any kind of oblique movement and it locks together. So we didn't have to have hinges and latches and that kind of stuff. We did it all with these surfaces which had corresponding uh, interlocking elements. And you know, there, there's a bunch of stuff I didn't bring, but like the St. Colin Museum competition, the Lords on Sunset project, um, a whole series of things have developed out of this idea of a ceiling and a floor surface which kind of bite together to make a room or to make a volume. And you'll see it come up, I'll show you in the Bloom House, the same idea where a ceiling and floor fold up towards each other. Um, so that approach of instead of having hinges and clasps, doing it with the surface, also came through in a couple of projects for Alessi. Um, you know, I would just say that Alberto Alessi, when he asked all of us to do cups, he said, look, 
there's only one thing that I really have to demand that you do is put a handle on the cup because in the past all the architects don't like to put handles on their cups and everybody burns their hands when they try to drink out of an architect's cup. So no matter what you do, make sure there's a handle and I also would like a saucer. So it's a cup and a saucer. And so I had this idea to basically take the cup and the saucer and fold the saucer up around the cup and make one surface out of both things. So it's, it's a little bit like a Turkish teacup so that there's this outer surface that you hold on to and grip, which is a handle, and there's an inner surface that holds the hot liquid. So, um, you know, and when I showed it to him, I said, look, it's all handles. Like, it just handles everywhere. <laughs> and they're designed to correspond like that Visionaire case, so the two surfaces interlock with each other, so like only an architect would do, you can, you know, make these funny arrangements and grids and radii and things on your, on your tabletop. <coughs> so, same thing with the coffee and tea set, where the, there's an inner flask and two outer surfaces, and the surfaces are textured so you can grip them. And there's a silicon bond between the two so you don't burn your hand. But what's kind of another version of that is that the tray, um, is double-sided so that when you flip the tray in this direction, each one of the coffee and teapots rests on the tray in its own spot. And then when you flip it over, the tray is designed so that the back of the pots correspond and interlock into the tray. So when it's empty, you can leave it out on your coffee table, kind of opened up like a flower. And then when it's full, you flip it around, you turn the tray upside down and everything rests on the top. So again, it's using surfaces to interlock and connect and do the function of what would have been parts and pieces. So again, it's got handles, but it, the surface is the handle. Uh, everybody, I think, has heard about how we made it. The ravioli chair, same thing. Instead of having uh, a seat and a back with arms, I wanted to do a bucket. Like, uh, I mean, there have been other bucket chairs, like the coconut chair by Nelson and um, the Eames Lounge, the, the fiberglass lounge. But I also wanted to integrate the feet into the base. So instead of having legs, um, we worked for about a year and a half to get this thing to work with legs. I really wanted to have a three-legged chair um, and, and ended up having to have a four, kind of a four dimpled surface chair. I mean, it's close to having three legs, but we had to split the back. Um, and we scaled this thing down and milled a whole bunch of copies of it and put a crash helmet on my daughter and she came over every Thursday and would see how stable it was and test it. Um, <coughs> it also was originally, um, it's called the ravioli because at one point it had no, uh, no curvature in the gap. Like this was an absolutely straight line and this was a straight line around the back. So it was literally a sheet. So you could assemble these things next to each other and it's meant so that you can make a landscape out of it. Um, but it was actually Zaha and Patrick were in LA and they came by and they saw the prototypes and I had a couple that had a curve and then I had some that were flat and Patrick and Zaha were, you know, like, we completely understand what you're trying to do, but it looks it looks hideous with the flat thing. <laughs> so, anyway, it it now um, it can connect side to side, so you can make like benches out of them, and they can go nose to nose or back to back. And there's an ottoman as well that can connect to them, so you can start to build landscapes out of these things like a sheet. So there's a kind of hard sheet of support and a soft sheet of the top, and then. <laughs> I'm a little suspicious of the architect or designer as artist, and so I was asked to do an art edition of the ravioli chair that would sell for a lot more. So I thought of doing a kind of Vegas edition where we gold plated and silver plated the bases so to make the bases more kind of like metallic and hard, and then went super soft on the top and upholstered one with Heidschnucke and, and alpaca. 
And these plates, same idea, you know, surface working to do the job of um, multiple elements. Okay, the, the next kind of plasticity for me is a plasticity of variation. And, and to do that, designing a primitive. Um, this actually came out of the Kleiberg project in Amsterdam that we worked on all the way through construction documents to rationalize a series of vertical trusses, all of which were different, but all of them had exactly the same number of components. Uh, it's just the way the components were assembled would give us the variation. Um, which was an idea that went back to the embryological house. Um, but here I think it's a kind of more, uh, better illustration that also I uh, had never shown the students. And that's this uh, idea of a primitive which has all of the information necessary to make specific variations, but is yet to be unfolded. So when um, Alessi Alberto said, why don't you try doing some flatware? I said, sounds great, because I knew flatware had a lot of different pieces. And I said, well, how many pieces do you want me to design? He said, well, a typical flatware set will have 52 pieces, including all the serving elements, but we never do that. So what you really do is design a spoon, make a perfect spoon, bring it to me, and with my team, we'll take the spoon and transform it into the fork and the knife. And then once we get that, we'll turn it into all the serving elements. He says, that's the way it's always been done. And I said, well, that's like totally 19. That sounds like Colin Rowe. You know, basically, like, do the perfect spoon, and then we'll do the bad versions of the spoon for everything else. So on the way back, I did this little doodle where there's an idea that there's a primitive that has everything it needs to become a spoon or a fork or a knife but has yet to be specified. And so the elements that I thought I needed for that were the handle, the tines, the thing that would make the points, uh, blades and webs for making spoons. <coughs> so we built a kind of uh, primitive and started running through how to go from a spoon to a knife to forks. Um, and around, just played, basically played with the tool to get the tool to do things, ladles. Uh, then I started to learn something about flatware and found out that there are all these, um, uh, let's say, not really typologies, but vernaculars for serving elements and eating elements, which I was ignorant about. But, you know, that a pastry spoon is like a fork with two of its gaps filled in, that you always eat a salad with a three-tined fork, and you eat the meal with a four-tined fork, and dessert sometimes fruit can be eaten with a five-tined fork. Um, and, and I just started to learn. So if you're one of these people that knows something about flatware, you start to identify things like strawberry forks and <laughs> oyster spoons and bacon forks, which is this one right here. Um, you know, th this is one of the pastry ones. That's for strawberries again. Um, you know, all the ladles and things for stirring iced tea, things for stirring espresso, things for berries and cream. So they're all, you know, they, they occupy a typology, but they're all transformations of that primitive in different directions. So what it does is it lets, lets you have something where every one of them is a variation, but they're variations within a single family. So the plasticity and continuity is what lets you see these things as all being related, to all the knives. Um, but, but they hang together as a group. Um, so for me, that's, it, it's what architects are very good at is, for instance, designing and documenting a curtain wall where every component of the curtain wall is unique, but every one of those unique parts makes a whole. So that whole part-to-whole -whole expertise that comes from a couple thousand years of our discipline is really useful when you move into kind of plasticity of design and literal plastics of design. Okay, another characteristic is the you know, modular repetition and standardization. 
um, in terms of that kind of plastic variation. Um, I'll show you where we started with a typological repetition uh, and actually tempered the design with some literal repetition. Um, we went through two different phases for a public housing project in Valencia, in this region um, that Vicente Guayar um, terms Sociopolis. And Vicente, he lectured here a couple of years ago, so you've probably seen the master plan for it. Um, but we were originally given, in a, in a kind of uh, endearing but naive way, the Spanish government decided they wanted to generously make houses for the people that they didn't previously think deserved houses, like old people, handicapped people, single mothers, uh, immigrants, and I was given the artists. Um, and so what I did is I came up with a total area for every apartment that would include a living space and a studio space. And the line between living space and studio space would always fluctuate. So that was the principle where it started. We ended up losing that specificity of artist housing. It just became socially subsidized uh, housing. But we kept that idea of typological variation of units. Um, so it ends up there's 26 units now, not 16. But every one of those 26 has some variation in its plan. Um, the way we modulate that is through these light wells or voids that cut through the block. And each one of those light wells or voids is different. Um, it started off that they were, you know, extremely, had a, a high degree of variation. But so you can see here where the poche is, this is the face of those voids. And then at the ends there are two kind of half voids. And as the units stack up, you can see every one of the bedrooms changes. There's, you know, one and two bedroom units and they all vary based on the undulation of this skin. Um, I don't believe there was any economy to it, except that there actually was, because the people pricing it thought it looked easier to build. Um, so um, we started working with a Spanish curtain wall company who wanted to get some degree of modularization into the skin. And so we've worked to get these super component elements, which are one unit large, although they start at the either the sill or the head of the windows and break, and they can be flipped upside down. But within these super components, every one of the panels is the same. And we get a degree of modularization and repetition in these elements. And by arraying them and flipping them, we get these chasms that are always unique. Then initially I thought that these would be some kind of mirror finished aluminum and that we would use reflective uh, glass to try to make a single kind of disco ball surface. But uh, in the renderings, and even worse in the physical model, it, it had this Flintstone quality of these punch windows. Um, so here we ended up taking the effect we wanted, or the effect I wanted, which was a, of this reflective kind of crystal, and building it literally at the scale of a building. So instead of saying, let's find a material that looks like a disco ball, like mirror finished, anodized, clear anodized aluminum, why not take the disco ball and say that it's six different colors, and that every panel would have one of those six different colors? And this was a thing, um, I've been talking to, to Frank Gehry about the Arc of the World project and how to produce a gradation from green to red through panels. And we both kind of looked at each other and said, well, just do every panel a different color and pixelate it and build like a pointillist facade. And so, um, and he was talking about the same thing for the winery where he had like 25 different colors of rose titanium. And he said, we can't pick which one to do. And we both looked at each other and said, you know, why don't you do them all? So same idea. So what we did is we took, um, not in any scientific way, 
but tried to build it like a rendering. Um, and this was also, when I worked for Peter Eisenman, I was uh, working on the Frankfurt Biocentrum and had built a little wood model. And Bob Slutsky used to pick all the colors for Peter, and Slutsky would pick the colors and then just tell you how much gray to add to the colors to make them look like kind of Pepto-Bismol and like a sweet tart or something. And so I, I think everybody in the office hated those colors. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, like in a resistant response, I spent a Saturday and added a different amount of gray to each color. So I always had five different shades of the same color, and I would paint the top of the model the lightest, and one side a little bit darker, and then another side a little darker, and then the back side I would paint really dark. So it looked like it was in shade, like really strong shade. And it was a really creepy model because it looked like it was lit in a room that wasn't lit. So we did the same thing here where we took uh, white, black, uh, brush finish, mirror finish, copper, and gold aluminum anodized panels. So he said, we use the same panel, we'll just anodize it in six different colors, plus we'll have the glass. So you can see, you know, here's gold, there's copper, there's black, there's white, there's mirror finish, there's brush finish, and then there's glass. And with those six colors plus glass, we could produce a disco ball, but by physically building it with all the colors, and it took the whammy off of the windows. So that kind of gradation and pixelization of components, you know, works really well at the scale of the building. Well, or so, so I hope. I mean, we'll see. Um, but that kind of intricacy of texture and pattern I mean, to go back, this is a literal piece of plastic that I did with the painter Fabian Marcaccio. It's like a 100-foot long, self-supporting plastic shell, which was digitally printed by Fabian. Um, and also, it was the first thing where um, Fabian gave us the digital files to print and had ideas about, and I knew it was coming because we'd done a project at the Secession previously, that once you put it together, Fabian comes with like buckets of silicon and tries to, you know, connect across the panels, the construction panels and the grid panels with these big silicon uh, splooges. And so I thought, well, how could I help that effort and maybe minimize on the silicon? So I took a, a two-dimensional brush stroke and started mapping that two-dimensional brush stroke as three-dimensional pattern across the surface. And when we were milling the molds, um, I decided to step the bit to generate this corrugated pattern. And that ended up becoming a kind of like a signature thing that we did in interiors for a while, where by stepping the bit, we would produce a texture. The texture would make the continuity across the panels. So this is for an interior in LA, this Uniserve headquarters where we did that for Facuform panels. This is a detail of the interior of the Pretty Good Life showroom in Stockholm, Sweden, where we did that to kind of integrate the, the shelves, the support shelves. Um, but that kind of um, texture and intricate patterning um, produced a, an effect where the texture was intricate to the form and the surface. So as it spreads out where it gets more, you know, deeply curved like this, you get a different kind of voluptuous effect across the surface. So, I mean, like the frog, not that it was looking like a frog, but this is a frog from the Mac show next door, um, where we did these panels with, uh, which actually, Justin, I forgot to grab. Um, but the idea here is that the form and pattern changes intricate to the, the shape. So the texture tracks the, the form and gradiates across the form. Okay. Now comes that thing where I just threw in a new project, which has nothing to do with plastics. <laughs> so, um, but, but we'll see. The, <coughs> 
I've, I've made a, a shift in some things, and you could see it in the Sociopolis housing, from literal curves to, uh, which are based on calculus, to polylines, which can become smooth like splines, which are based on partial differential equations. And we've talked about this in my studio, so if anybody's here not in my studio and interested, ask somebody, but I'm not going to talk to you about partial differential equations at 8 o'clock at night in a hot room. But the principle is fairly simple. When you draw a spline curve with calculus, you're drawing an imaginary curve that flows through points. If you want to find out the actual shape or location of points on that imaginary curve, you have to infinitesimally keep dividing that up. So if you draw or model with splines, you're dealing with this very cumbersome piece of mathematics, which is constantly subdividing all the curves up to show you what they look like on the screen and to find how they intersect with each other and to loft surfaces through each other. You're dealing with as much smoothness an infinite amount of smoothness, which is calibrated for however much uh, power your computer happens to have at the time. And in response to that, there's been a move to use modeling from the other direction using partial differential equations, which is literally the same mathematics as calculus, just approaching the infinitesimal from fixed point, using this thing called Chaikin's algorithm. So. Here are my clients pointing at my building. Uh, but this is right next door to Zaha and Jean Nouvel and Frank Gehry in Abu Dhabi. There's a, a 18 pavilion complex along a artificial, well not artificial, around a, um, a canal. And it's meant to be and will most likely literally be a Venice Biennale where there are these pavilions, and twice a year the pavilions will be filled with art by a single living artist. Uh, and then also twice a year they'll be used as um, pavilions you can rent for trade shows and um, commercial exhibits. So uh, Tom Krenz uh, kind of threw me a curveball and gave me a site that was both a bridge and a museum, or a, and an art hall. And there, it, there's no permanent collection or anything, obviously, so um, it's mostly gallery space. So in response to that bridge and museum principle, and also because of the location in Abu Dhabi, I worked with this method of corner smoothing, which um, I think maybe I'll go to a better image. These are just some of the precedents that I kind of started with, like an occupiable bridge. This, uh, this came from Thomas Auer, which is um, kind of heat chimneys that we would use. So instead of doing them in masonry, there are these glass towers that get superheated up to a couple hundred degrees in the top. And that superheated air rises. And those glass volumes are like pipes that then go down and run along the water. So we pull cool air off the water, drag it through the building, and then expel it out the top of the building as superheated air. And then the, the domes with squinches. Um, this is the site. So there's two, you have to access it from two points, but only with one front door. So you can come up these long ramps here, or you can come up a short escalator here, or a long ramp there, a short escalator there. You come into this bridge, and there's a bridge gallery, and then galleries on both sides. Um, and the way the corner smoothing works is you take a polyline with fixed points, and you go 25% of each line and clip the corner off of it and then you go 25% of the next line and clip the corner off that. If you keep doing that infinitely, you'll get exactly the same number of points as you would get if you infinitely subdivided a spline curve. Um, it's just that you start with the points and end up with things that approach curves rather than starting with imaginary curves and moving towards things which have fixed points. So it's what subdivision surfaces are based on. It's, um, 
you know, it, it's called corner cutting, and it's Chaikin's algorithm that does it. But we use that process of progressively smoothing to also make these vaulted cells, which were reminiscent of some of the squinches and transformations from wall to dome in early Christian and Islamic architecture. So it also let us make a, a kind of a soffit level that's uniform where we can build temporary walls. So we can come up with 23 different gallery spaces, not all of which everybody is totally happy with, but the idea is that you get a variety of scales of spaces that you can break down, uh, or you can have just one big vast space. So this is showing Tom Sachs, you know, to show that you can fit Tom Sachs' work in the hall. Um, and, and, and there's that registration level where all of these could become individual rooms, each one with a kind of central oculus. And then the bridge gallery is glass because that's part of that whole um, kind of superheated air element that runs through the building. This is the kind of very first concept design model we've done that shows these chimneys, that kind of long, open, covered glass area that sucks into them, and then these vaults, and then, you know, kind of first pass at the landscaping that would integrate with those vaults. Um, the, this is something we did uh, summer before last for the new design headquarters for BMW, um, where now this is more like a kind of literal disco ball element, but the, the BMW was, they're not going to do it. They were hoping to move all of their brand um, studios into one single consolidated building. So, Rolls-Royce and BMW and Mini Cooper and the motorcycle division. But they wanted to move them all into one building and the, the kind of big event and the big uh, social event is showing the cars on the roof to their board and putting the cars into gallery spaces to review them under um, specific kind of fluorescent lighting. And it's where everybody, it's almost like a review space here at the university. It's where everybody sees what everybody else is doing, and it's also totally secretive and private. So we came up with a proposal that wrapped the building skin in this fairly opaque element and then built these large, vast spans for collecting all of the all of the kind of public functions of the studios. Um, <clears throat> also in terms of a kind of chunky plastic quality, this is um, a landmark tower, you know, like everything. This, we worked on this summer in a Gensler master plan in Guangzhou, Korea for the steel company POSCO. Back when POSCO stock was like $170 a share, it's now like $35 a share, and back when people were building things like this. But it's a, a mixed use, two mixed use towers. They wanted to have a gateway, and so we made this kind of light, clunky little connection where they inflect towards each other. Um, it's very much like our World Trade Center scheme, where it's built using uh, uniform plates that spiral around the pores to generate that. Okay, so back to literal plastic. When I say composites, I mean fiber, well, construction where fibers are held in place by some uh, medium. Could be resin, could be concrete, and then solid surfaces, which are literally poured plastic surfaces, uh, which can be milled or cut or formed. Um, I would just start off, Christy mentioned, like how much... Uh, how much of my mental focus is oriented towards the ocean lately? Um, I think one of the reasons why is because of the forms, like this killer whale. Um, the other is because I spend a lot of time on big pieces of plastic like this. Like this is a giant plastic boat 
with plastic sails, plastic mass, plastic boom, plastic rigging. Everything on this thing is made of resin. So instead of sails being made of cloth, there are two sheets of mylar with aramide and carbon fibers with glue holding them together. They're very light and strong. All the rigging and the lines uh, is now Spectra or PBO or Vectran, but it's all plastics. The boom, which used to be wood or aluminum, is now all autoclaved carbon fiber. Um, the boat is all carbon fiber and resin. It's got some balsa wood in it. <coughs> but, uh, but basically, it's a giant construction of plastics, which is stronger than any other material. Um, of its, of its scale and also light. Uh, you know, this boat, which is uh, 60 feet long, weighs, uh, in kilos I can't do, but it, it weighs about 4,500 pounds, everything up here, including all the sails and the rig. And then this piece of um, tooled steel, and this is literally depleted uranium. Uh, because it's so heavy and dense. Um, this whole thing weighs like 12,000 pounds. So, um, you know, the thing is super, super light. I mean, my whole boat weighs more than this thing does. But it's incredibly light and strong construction. And then this is really unbelievable, which is, it's called a foiling moth. Um, it's a kind of a boat where they have very loose rules about how you can modify it. And a few years ago, somebody showed up and put a wing on one. And everybody was sailing away, and all of a sudden, this guy in a wing lifted up out of the water and started going 30 miles an hour. So, but this is a boat where everything on it, um, except the person sailing it, weighs 80 pounds, which is like less than my nine-year-old daughter weighs. Um, so, so this kind of lightness of and high performance quality of plastics, I'm fascinated with the you know, the kind of liquidity and spatial depth you get with plastics, as well as the glossiness, the glow of these ceiling elements. That's the robot collection, the popular culture part of it, um, which I'm really interested in. Um, that's, that's, you know, one of the reasons to move towards composites. So this is a house that we just finished in Los Angeles. Um, the The house maximizes like every inch that we were allowed to take in terms of the site because it's on the beach and it's you're not really able to build a very big house on the beach. So all of the the massing is a block, and what the approach is is to not really carve out that block, but to modulate all the surfaces and faces of that block to make all of the rooms and spaces. So instead of um, for instance, instead of making a room, here the wall folds and blebs out to make a kind of open pocket. Same thing here, instead of a fireplace that gets attached into the wall, like the ravioli chair, the fireplace gets swallowed into the thickness of the wall. Um, same thing upstairs, all the bathroom elements, the beds, Everything gets sucked out of the floor or sucked off the wall or pulled down out of the ceiling so that the surfaces end up swallowing all this equipment and space through the house. Um, and then there's a, a kind of huge boat type construction ceiling which is lit, um, you know, that, that provides all the illumination in the living space. The windows are also you know, kind of curvilinearly pulled off the surface. So instead of punching windows or um, making a curtain wall or something, there's a piece of stainless steel that splits and forks apart and the windows get made in that. These are just some real early renderings of it. And now, I apologize, but they just moved in last week, so I've got probably more pictures than you're interested in seeing because I haven't really been through it so much. But so this is, you know, more or less how it's looking. The, uh, the walls, the curves of the walls were all constructed using a laser cutter. 
Um, this particular laser cutter is only about 10 years old, but we asked the people who did the laser cutting and they said they were using the same machine 30 years ago to laser cut wood and metal. So just for everybody that thinks like when you say plastics that it means you've got to go out and invent some miracle material that you can 3D print a building out of so you don't have to work on your geometry very well or think about construction, that's not what plastics is. I think, you know, this is something that's been around for a really long time. It's just nobody's ever really tapped it so much. So the what's also kind of interesting about this house is this wall arrived on the site in a bunch of packages with the little with um, stapled numbers on everything. And the foreman that was running the construction site called called up my office and said, look, tell Greg that the first laser cut would arrive, but he's not allowed to come over here and start unwrapping it because everything's numbered. And so I waited, and at lunchtime, his boss called me up and said, okay, my foreman's off the site. Let's go over and unwrap all that wood. And so we went over there, and with a pregnant woman, her husband, myself, and the owner of the contracting firm, we put this wall together in a little bit more than half an hour. So there was really only one way that it would all interlock together, and once we got it close, it was locked in. Um, and then somebody came in and just staple tacked all the pieces together, but the precision was built into the material. So, you know, then a couple days later comes a, a plasterer who's like a master plasterer who put paper and lath on it and worked this thing with custom-made stainless steel tools that we laser cut for him. And I mean, he was really amazing, this guy. And basically made this completely cellulite-free set of, of plaster, you know, trowel surfaces. So the combination of the expertise of a plasterer that's, you know, been plastering for 40 years plus the precision of the computer manufactured components, you know, let us get these, you know, surfaces which were, you know, pretty, pretty clean and, and smooth. Um, these are the, those, you know, flared windows that were also, we went to Pella and said, look, we want to make these curved windows, and we noticed you have these things called cathedral windows, which are a little like Palladian windows with a curved top, and so we just took the top and reflected it down to make all of the sills. Um, and then up on the roof, there's just a thing for holding the mechanical stuff, but it's close to the beach. Then, you know, the luminous ceiling we did with a, a guy that actually races on my sailboat, um, but who used to build the very first fiberglass sailboat down in San Diego, now more than half of his work is all in the building industry. Um, so he'll do a lot of real kind of not very interesting things like three-dimensional fiberglass signage and stuff like that, but he does a lot of work with custom designed um, surfaces. And what we did is, is actually at pretty great expense came up with a formulation of fiberglass that doesn't catch on fire and doesn't emit a lot of smoke. Because it's, it's funny, we went, the first thing we started with was the additive they used for the Boeing Dreamliner. And we said, oh, well, if they're using it for their carbon fiber, it must be good enough for the Los Angeles building code. And we ran a test on it, like immediately burst into flames. <laughs> I mean, it's like terrifying how much more stringent the building industry is than like the aerospace industry. But so we ended up getting a balance because if you get it not to flame, it tends to smoke like crazy. But so Bill figured out a system that's um, lets light transmit but still works with the, is a class A construction material. Um, he, Bill, actually built, he didn't know that mills existed 20 years ago. And he built himself out of chains his own mills, which one of them still cut the, the forms for this. So it's, he's a real kind of cowboy up in Sonoma County um, with this stuff. But so he, he does a lot of the very large scale milling. So he milled these forms, he just covers them in cooking aluminum foil, 
so they release. Um, these are all the parts um, kind of in storage. He built a steel table and assembled them all to make sure they were level. Um, yeah, then we put the same, a complementary plate up in the ceiling so we knew they matched up. And then we also found um, a really old lighting technology called cold cathode tubes. But before there were fire, um, um, fluorescent lights with ballasts, there was this version of a neon light called cold cathode lighting, which is dimmable. And it also lasts 15 years is the guarantee we got on it. But so we don't want to have to take this thing apart every two months to replace bulbs. So we found this curved uh, continuous lighting tube. It's a little bit like neon, but it's dimmable. Um, that runs down the length of the thing. That's like full power. It's usually not that bright. Um, then the other plastic elements, you can see kind of back in the kitchen. Uh, sorry, plastic shells. Oh, we also, we built, a lot of this stuff is all um, custom built in, but the floors upstairs are all bamboo. And so we designed this, uh, you know, bamboo bed, kind of comes out of the floor for raviolis. And then in the bathrooms, we did a thing where we kind of sucked the bathroom walls out to swallow up all the storage and the sinks and cabinets and towels and all that kind of stuff. Um, so these are the digital models for that. And uh, same thing in the kitchen, there's a breakfast table and a kitchen island all also made the same way. Um, the reason you're seeing like Zaha doing whole buildings based that uh, built out of Corian is Corian's patent expired a few months ago, and so Corian wants to show their competitors that they have a knowledge about building that their competitors don't have. So Corian's work, um, they had a hard time, but they they invented a forming method. Um, I don't think I have any of the molds. But they, they did very cheap foam molding and with a combination of vacuum bagging, vacuum forming, and bladder bagging. So they would put it on a vacuum former, they put the whole vacuum forming contraption in a vacuum bag, and then they also had like inflatable balloons where they needed to drive it down. And somebody with a bunch of valves would try to balance the pressure between the vacuum former, the bagging, and the inflatable pillows and drive the soft corian down into the molds. So, but that way we didn't have to build like stainless steel tools or two part molds or something. It's all slumped. <coughs> and it was all built um, by a company in Anaheim, Pacific West Line. They put it all together. Um, made sure everything was totally fair and smooth, and then bandsawed it into pieces so they could get it in the house and then welded it all back again. Um, these are the handles we did. Um, this is just like, just for the students, like you should always just ask. Like, this, at the end of the project, the poor client is like dying. And they say, you know what, I need handles for the kitchen, and please don't kill me, you know? And so, I, I said, well, what is like a stainless steel pole cost? And the contractor said like $12 or $14 a pole. And so we 3D printed these handles and went to the kitchen person and said, look, I know, you know, just please, how expensive would it be to make these handles and route around a little square and just weld them into the Corian and sand them smooth? He said, I'll get back to you. He comes back, it's like $7 a handle. <laughs> so um, we gave them these 3D prints and they made silicone molds and laminated them up. So you can see all the, you know, again, I mean, I guess I have a thing about handles, but instead of putting an attached handle on the surface, the surface bulges out and makes these little holes everywhere. Um, the kitchen island and the, the breakfast nook and everything, it's all monolithically, you know, molded out of Corian. And then in the bathrooms upstairs, all the sinks and cabinets and all that stuff is also molded and pulled out of the Corian. And then the tile, 
They tell you it's a computer, but it's actually a bunch of Dominican women in Miami place these tiles. So we did a rendering of the wall as a mosaic on all the surfaces of the bathroom. So it's, it's like a three-dimensional picture rendered on the opposite wall um, on both sides. That's the second bathroom. We're doing this crack and lamp with material eyes over the dining room table. They also have toy furniture, dining room table, and it's like a total Greg Lynn showroom over there. Um, okay, so the last thing, sorry, um, is the, the blob wall and the toy furniture, which is this approach to a new kind of brick. Um, and like I said, it, it came out a little bit of the Tom Friedman and Office Da dialogue in the Intricacy Show. But I wanted to take a modular element and handle it in a non-modular way. And I was playing with the idea for my own house. And a company called Panelite was bidding on building some of the walls in the Bloom House. And they saw the model sitting there and they said, what's that? And I said, oh, it's this idea I have about toy, furniture, um, arrays of walls. And so we ended up uh, you know, launching this as a commercial product. So the first thing I did is thought, well, I'd really like to just use recycled toys to build these walls. And uh, looked around and, you know, bottom line is it's very hard to get several thousand identical recycled toys. Um, and to buy them new was very expensive. So what I did is I just designed my own toy, like my own brick. And believe it or not, it took like six months to get the right brick. But I wanted it to have a little bit of a Mickey Mouse um, uh, quality, like a kind of pop quality where you'd recognize the, the mouse head in it. Um, I also wanted it to be like, uh, unlike let's say the walls in that house I just showed you, which are smooth, I wanted to make a wall which was rusticated or, you know, rough, like a rough plastic wall. So the walls have uh, three nodes, like Part of the reason they have three nodes is so you can, I don't know how else to say it, but take the, the nose of one and put it in the crotch of the other to lock them together. So there's a Y and a, and a T, and the Y and the T lock, so you can get closed walls, but if you rotate them, they can become like screens where they have openings between them. Also, if you rotate them, they get very bumpy, whereas if you tuck them all into each other, they get a lot smoother. So you can produce, you know, different variegated kind of rustic surfaces with it. The principle is that the brick, there's one tool and we just make these things over and over and over again. It takes like 10 or 15 minutes to make one. Um, and there's a digital file of one of those. And so we then take a surface and array those bricks along the surface, find where they intersect, take the line of intersection, translate it to the movement of a robotic tool and cut those chunks of plastic off and then throw them back in the chopper and roto mold them back. This is the robot at um, Andreas Froch's uh, shop that cuts them up. <coughs> we had to make like a little custom fiberglass, uh, well two custom fiberglass uh, tables basically that grip these things. And so you input the tool path in this thing, cuts it on the top, and then you spin it, and it cuts it on the bottom. I'll show you some videos of the robot. It's pretty funny. Um, these are the trimmed bricks, and you know they all interlock and weld together to make these constructions. Um, this is us driving it around LA. I realized on the drive, it's probably better as a landscape thing. At uh, Sire, we decided, and also for the Venice Biennale, I would say, we decided to build a dome. And, you know, I knew it was one of those things where everybody was like, Greg, when are you going to give us the shape of the dome? And I kept saying, oh, I'll work on it, I'll work on it. I didn't play it around, didn't know what shape to make, so finally I just did like a giant brick. 
So all of these things array across the surface of a huge brick. Um, and you know, we learned a lot in building it, let's just say with Sci Arc students, not to point any fingers at students in general, but uh, we found out two things about this. Um, one is that to get them to this scale, we need some kind of a jig or some kind of a scaffold so that we can precisely locate every one of these things in space. Um, you know, and so the, you know, what happened is, you can see it, everybody started at a different side and started building up and up and up and up. Pretty soon they got to the point where they would meet and there are these like huge, you know, hideous gaps everywhere exactly where you need the thing to be strong. So it got very, very floppy. One end of it fell off, like thankfully right at the end of the opening. We came in the next morning and realized that it was about four feet wider than it was the night before. <laughs> and, you know, tried to jack it together and started to break apart. We ended up having to take it apart into some pretty big chunks and weld it back together. And anyway, it's, you know, to get it to the scale of a building, um, because the, like uh, the Nickelodeon hotel chain has bought some of these for their lobbies and Planet Hollywood was interested in some of them as pool cabanas. There's a few things we have to do before we can do that. One is we have to get all the wells absolutely tight because if they get wet, things are going to start growing inside the cavities and that won't be good. So we have to figure out how to get them totally weather tight and not trapping water and, and animals and plants. <laughs> Uh, that's not insurmountable. I mean, we can, we can do that. The second thing, though, is we need to find a construction system where we can locate these things precisely in space and know if we're starting to drift in terms of accuracy when we weld them together. That's actually much more of a challenge. Um, okay, but so the what's funny is uh, Aaron Betsky, who's a commissioner of the Biennale, did a lighting and signage scheme of basically blob walls and realized that if I put this blob wall in the show, it would be like a version of his signage scheme. And he called me very late in the game and said, you know, I've been thinking about the blob wall. You've already done it. I don't want it here. I want you to do something new. And we had a very short time to do it. And so, and we were also struggling figuring out, you know, well, this thing is like practically collapsing in the gallery and our plan was to put it on top of a container ship and take it through the Panama Canal to Venice and we thought well what are the odds of this making it to Italy and the open ocean anyway so I went back and I said okay well let's do the toy furniture thing um, and you know I, I, I'm happier with this because it's a little bit more pop culture and also a lot kind of stranger and kinkier than the blob wall. So we took, um, we were kind of limited to toys that we could get, and also three of these toys were toys that were my kids, and I thought, well, they were coming to Italy with me anyway for the opening. I thought it would be fun to take their toys and put them into the walls. So one of we took this kind of rocking horse dog, uh, like a kid's seat eggplant, uh, a sled, like a little snow sled of a shark, and a little snow sled of a duck. Um, what's also funny is, uh, that's American, that's Italian, that's German, and that's German. And like all the Italians like love the eggplant, all the Americans like the dog. It's very funny. And then there's a whale we also add that I don't have. Um, and we, they're coated in powder so they could be scanned. But we put them into, we did, we, somebody, we hired 3D scanned these into a point cloud and built surfaces of them. And then we intersected the surfaces and found their intersection. And uh, cut them up. This is the I mean, this is what's already downstairs, but in case anybody didn't see it, I'll fast forward it. Um, You know, so they were intersected with each other, then we would find the curves that describe their intersection, 
program those into the tool paths for this five-axis robot. The, I don't have an image of the robot jamming up, but what's great is this robot you know, moves around and cuts, and at a certain point, all of its joints get kind of turned around, like it'll just go around like this, and it'll get jammed where it can't reach anymore. <laughs> And it'll pull up and it'll shake like this. <laughs> so, uh, where's the robot? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, so this is Andreas' the robot. This is pretty much real time how it cuts. Yeah, but so he built this poor duck. He <laughs> built this little yeah, rotisserie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's one where you see it like slicing its head open. It's particularly <laughs> sinister. <laughs> and these are, you know, kind of higher quality roto molded. I mean, we're learning a lot about this stuff. Like, dark color roto-molded plastic has half the strength of light colored plastic. Nobody knows why, but it just does. But so there's all kinds of weird tolerances and things about all this stuff that we're starting to get a handle on. But anyway, these constructions are really solid. Um, They're also, they're much more intricate in terms of, you can see the cutting head have to spin around so it always stays perpendicular to the surfaces. But there's a lot of little detail and intricacy on these things that aren't on the blob walls. Anyway, you can see all this stuff downstairs. Um, What's well, great are all the little like faces and noses and things like that um, that are there that aren't in the other one. Um, in terms of um, that kind of motion and plasticity, um, I've also been working. Well, I'll just show you the funniest thing first. Well, I've been working with friends in the film industry and you know also just clients in the film industry. Um, because I worked on a competition that Brad Pitt was a consultant, what, I don't know what you want to call him. He was our PR person for the Grand Avenue competition. There was a film, uh, there is a film being made called Divide, and they wanted to attach Brad Pitt to it as the star. And I think it was more about that than the design I gave them, but they came and they said, look, here's a script. Uh, we would like you to design four planets for us uh, for this film. And the idea is that you would take everything, you know, reasonable off the Earth and put it in this planet and then just abandon all these people on Earth and just pull oil and raw materials off and everybody was going to live up here in kind of bliss. Um, and Brad Pitt was going to be one of the people down on the ground. Um, but so, you know, we designed this planet. Um, we also for Let's see if the sound works. A friend of mine's an assistant director for all of Werner Herzog's movies. And um, and Werner lives in Venice Beach around the corner. And so they were doing a low budget film directed by the writer for Incredible Hulk and uh, all the Mar a lot of the Marvel comics and a guy named Zach Penn. There's a movie, it just came out, it's called The Grand, and it's about a drug-addicted son of a casino owner who gambles away his dad's casino and needs to win a poker tournament in order to keep it in the family. And the, the Woody Harrelson plays that guy. And then there's um, six or so other competitors in the poker tournament, and it's a script that's written halfway through the film and then when they start playing the poker tournament, the script ends, and they have to all stay in their character. Um, but so they needed <coughs> models of, of failed casinos. And so they all came over to the office and just grabbed a bunch of stuff 
and said, we'll bring it back in two weeks. And they used the very first blob wall model as a casino. And uh, they also, because they were just getting stuff, this wasn't in the script. So Woody Harrelson was improvising, trying to explain what these failed casinos were. Like this one is, uh, you should see the movie, it's a funny movie. I like this one too. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry, the one to the. I like this. Whoop, whoop, hold on, Woody. I like this one. The one to the left is the based on the Chicago fire and it burned down. That one next to it is a nuclear reactor which you couldn't get zoning permission for. And then this one is a thing they called Hector's frozen cart because they thought it was a funny <laughs> thing. I like this one too. It's called Hector's Frozen Cart. Now I've got to be candid with you and let you know that I don't know what I was thinking when I came up with this particular design, but I was under the influence of oh, cocaine and heroin and LSD and mushrooms and some ecstasy. And you know how sometimes you get that cocktail just right and then it's just like, boom. Um, also, uh, sorry, it's tough to compete with that with these things. Um, this was a, an exhibition design I did with Imaginary Forces, and I'll, I'll show you a few Imaginary Forces um, collaborations and where there were consultants on buildings. I'll show you some stuff, but they're movie title people that I met um, in an exhibition at Wexner Center maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago, and Peter Frankfurt's now like, you know, oops, you don't need that. Um, you know, Peter's now very, you know, good friend, we hang out, do all kinds of stuff, and we'll tend to try to do these harebrained schemes. For this, Herbert Mouchamp came to us and said uh, that he'd written a story of the history of New York architecture in three acts, and instead of having models of all the buildings he discussed, he wanted to do a film, an immersive film. So with Imaginary Forces, we came up with this multi-screen projection, and I came up with the design of these screens, which are uh, weather balloons. I mean, they're not literal weather balloons, but they're made by a weather balloon company. And so they're these kind of long, conical, inflated balloons, and at the end of each one is a video projector, and at the end is a half sphere. And what Imaginary Forces did was, um, wait till the circles come up, you know, they, edited the film in these round windows, and then they also stretched the images to correct for the distortion of the half sphere. And we inflated these balloons and hung them in this funny shaped uh, space, but you really felt like you were in, you know, in this, you know, volume of all these kind of weird bulbous uh, shapes. So anyway, the, the kind of immersive screen, this was our first attempt at a, you know, a video film that you could actually kind of be in rather than look at. Um, the most recent thing we've done together um, is this also kind of equally megalomaniacal thing called New City. Paola Antonelli asked uh, myself, Imaginary Forces, and a production designer named Alex McDowell, who did Charlie the Chocolate Factory and Fight Club and Minority Report, um, designed all that stuff to do an ideal city um, for today. So, and Paolo, because she's Italian, I thought of an ideal city. Let me see if I have an image of it. Uh, um, no, I don't. Like, um, you know, the reference that I gave to Alex and Peter was uh, Vignola's Villa Farnese and Caparola in the Mappamundo room, where in the Renaissance they would paint maps 
but the maps would have all kinds of you know people's faces and imagery and commerce and goods and fruit and vegetables and animals and all kinds of weird stuff would be embedded into these maps and they would design these map rooms which integrated painting and architecture into a kind of total environment that included commerce and entertainment and geography and territory you know like kind of empire and so we said well let's try to do the same thing only it's kind of where you would go instead of google earth because also google earth just seemed wrong to me that i mean i think google Earth's great but the idea that you open up google earth and you see a kind of 15th century globe you know seems a little odd like the world the internet world i don't think really looks like a globe that spins around on an axis so we came up with these manifolds where we broke down each continent um, and located volume and surface area within each one of these continents and made 8 billion addresses. So there's 8 billion dots in here that start to define density. And instead of having, you know, say, Little Havana um, in Miami, you would instead get the intersect, well, that's actually not much of an intersection, let's say uh, a little Italy in Hong Kong, instead of rotating Hong Kong to, or instead of connecting Hong Kong to Italy as a transposition of people, you can rotate these, these donuts so those points always intersect each other. Um, and the mission here is to do this all in real time with real time rendering we're working with a real time rendering company to try to do that to get some kind of an interactive experience you know which has the kind of geography connectivity superimposition of place and time uh, with a whole series of lenses, like a weather lens, a commerce lens, an entertainment lens, as well as an architecture lens. Um, and if we really go through kind of what everybody's roles are, I, I don't know what Alex is, but Peter at Imaginary Forces is kind of the mayor of New City. Like, he's deciding what the content is. I'm the master planner, and the idea is that, you know, we're going to get a three-dimensional master plan, something like this, and then go out and commission, you know, maybe 20 friends and colleagues to then come in and do neighborhoods and regions in New City. Um, anyway, so this is just a very kind of first pass at it for MoMA. <coughs> um, let's make sure. Maybe before you can do this, I'll just show you a totally insane thing, uh, which is this. It's, yeah, it's insane and sad, actually. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, probably some people know, it's like when Wolf kept talking to me about RoboFish, um, this is what he was talking about. Um, I was asked by David Rockwell to do a master plan for a tropical island family gambling resort in Singapore um, because they had um, already gotten into the competition with uh, the idea of a flower, like a tulip. And they needed a master plan that looked like a tulip. And this guy, Saul Kersner, who invented destination resorts, integrated resorts, where there's a little tiny casino in a huge theme park in, you know, South Africa or the Bahamas. And he invented that whole market, which is now everywhere. And he was trying to buy this island in Singapore uh, and put a theme park on it. <coughs> I should explain to Peter Arnalis, too. So um, I started working on this thing, and I had dinner with Frank, and Frank said, what's going on in the office? And I told him, I said, oh, and I'm doing this crazy flower master plan for some maniac named Saul Kersner. And Frank said, oh, Saul's trying to hire me to do the casino. Let's just go together and tell him we'll only do it if we get the whole thing. So um, we did that, and Saul, you know, 
he was like a fabulous guy, and his son Butch ran the thing. And anyway, we realized we didn't know anything about entertainment. I mean, what we both agreed on was that we would put egos aside and try to do the first moving building. Because Frank had read Animal Form and you know, was saying like literally that I should do a moving building. I kept saying no. And then I looked at his Times Square uh, proposal from 20 years ago with the chain link that would move and the big robotic arms. And we realized, yeah, let's try to do like a giant moving building that would, be cut, that would integrate uh, multimedia into its skin. And so, I mean, this is as good a view of any, but there are these glass towers that have projection, like 70 millimeter projection on them, as well as LED project projection in them, that would have these sea monster images all over them. And during the day, they're on these giant pylons and would relax and make shade over an eight million gallon tank with a whale shark in it. And then at night, they would lift up and become these kind of petals looking back to the city of Singapore. Um, but so we had that architectural idea. What we didn't have was any content. And all Saul had was this stupid whale shark, which is like a truck. I mean, it, to drive a whale shark through a resort is pretty impossible. So Frank brought in a guy named Peter Arnell, who, to kind of sing Peter's praises, Peter was trained as an architect and uh, was the first person to do architectural monographs. He did the first Venturi monograph, the first Gary monograph, the first Meyer monograph with his partner Ted Bickford. While he was in New York doing books, he had the idea to do advertisements that he called art. So he did the DKNY mural on 25th Street and 6th Avenue which was a Statue of Liberty, but punched out of a stencil of DKNY. And he got zoning permission for it by saying it was an artwork. And Donna Karen changed the name of her company to DKNY because that was so successful. And Peter went on to patent that approach to advertising in New York City. And Peter then went after Donna Karen and said, I just rebranded your company, so you owe me 10% of your company, which she gave him. And he then started a branding agency called Arnell Group. And what he does is think about environment and advertising and figure out a way to work like an architect without doing architecture to do environmental um, branding. <coughs> he also just takes everything in short. He did like Armani Exchange became AX, Reebok became RBK. Um, so he does all that. He also, while he does it, ends up owning big chunks of those companies. So <laughs> next to Saul Kersner, who's a lot richer than Peter, Peter's like one of the wealthiest. I mean, he's made hundreds of millions of dollars just doing that stuff at the scale of architecture. So Frank brought in Peter, and Peter just went insane. I mean, right away he said, it's Bernini and a Gundam mating to make a sea monster that's rolled out of the sea. And Peter said, we got to get rid of these animals and whale sharks because it's inhumane and we need robotic animatronic animals and kids with RFID tags in their room keys. So the kids walk up to a tank and some weird robot swims up to them and says, you know, hi, Annie, how was your trip from Vienna? It's so nice that you're back again. You're going to have a good birthday. And it knows all the information and they would interact with all these animals and it got completely out of control and Peter brought in, you know, everybody from, you know, Jansen with his strand beasts to um, uh, Peter, uh, the Lord of the Rings guy from New Zealand, Peter uh, Jackson. Jackson. Um, everybody was in, like, just driving the kind of animated robot stuff as deep into the project in every way that they could. And so, I'll show you. Oh, it's like, you know, those are those um, towers that drop. The whole thing is a kind of lake, and then the casino and all the hotels and everything are down around that lake. Um, poor Butch died in a helicopter accident right as we were turning this thing in, I think is one of the reasons we didn't get it. Um, 
There's a water park down here, which all the slides and everything are clad in these metal skins. Big, you know, 2,500 room hotel here with, you know, uh, what's called the Gardens of Robotanica, where we worked with um, Rob Brooks from MIT. A uh, bunch of, get that off of there. There's Peter. Peter also used to weigh, he like, decided he was heavy and lost 250 pounds in like three months by eating oranges. He's got an orange guy that just travels with him everywhere peeling oranges for him. <laughs> <laughs> so he's one of the coolest, most dialed in, totally insane people I've ever met in my life. Um, so anyway, it, you know, Imaginary Force has also worked on visualizing all this. Um, You'll see a couple views where we rented a helicopter and the client saved like $500 by not renting a Steadicam. But this is the Gardens of Robotanica. There's Rod. Um, anyway, all of this visualizing of the robots and stuff was all here. Um, I mean, riff, riffing off of all our stuff, but. Um, I want to show the helicopter shot. But so they rented a helicopter with no steady cam, so all of our aerial shot looks like kind of a Vietnam <laughs> helicopter or something. So they had to rotoscope all the shakes into the camera moves. The whale shark. Anyway, I think theme parks are really where it's at. I mean, I think there's nothing more challenged. Yeah, there's the shaky view. You know. No place architecture is more relevant right now than rethinking what's pretty much a, a set of ideas that hasn't been rethought since Walt Disney. Anyway, that's a pretty weird project. And then, in a more tasteful way, is this um, restaurant. This is the last thing I'll show you. So this is a new building right in front. Right now, this photograph um, that this is collaged into is taken from the new Renzo Piano entry to LACMA on Wilshire Boulevard. And a local developer bought a 30-story tower across the street, which turned out was um, mostly vacant when he bought it, and has renovated it and been pretty successful already in leasing it out. And the front zone, it's about 90 feet wide, and it's just it was designed as a tar pit, because it's right across from the Little Bray Tar Pits. And the same architect that did LACMA did the, these towers and literally designed bubbling tar in front of the lobby, which is not what Class A office leaves people want these days. So right now it's just grass, but it's just a kind of empty zone. So um, Wayne had a little mini competition, but um, you know our proposal, this is now where we're at with it. It's not what we wanted to think with, but it's very similar. Our proposal was to hold this corner of Ogden and Wilshire so that people coming from LACMA across the street would hit this kind of anchor, but then to stretch the, uh, a gateway across the whole front zone of the building, and that gateway would be a shade trellis that would let us have people sitting outside 12 months out of the year. So, um, I mean, it's not, you know, it's the trellis is made out of a series of blades, and those blades are oriented so in December you get sun shining right through the trellis down to all the outdoor seating. But the blades get deeper so that in the summertime, when the sun is right overhead during lunchtime, you get 100% shade. And then obviously the seasons in between, you get something in between. So it doesn't keep rain out, it's just a, a series of blades. But it's for, for shade. It also makes a gateway to the lobby of the tower. <coughs> and we're working with a landscape architect, Nord Erickson, to kind of recontour 
the landscape so that it is, has a little bit of play off the trellis. But the trellis is deep, not in any scientific way, but it's deep where you need more shade and it's shallower where you don't. Um, but so to take advantage of that trellis at night, and you know, LA is um, it's a city of boulevards. So when you make a pedestrian scale move, you also need to make an automobile scale move. So this trellis makes a nice pedestrian space for people to have sandwiches and coffee and stuff. It also is a landmark um, at the scale of somebody driving down Wilshire Boulevard at 50 miles an hour. And so at night what we wanted to do is not make a big sign, but make a kind of atmosphere that would work at a 50 mile an hour speed, so you'd see it change as you drove by, but it wouldn't be so frantic that you'd like have a seizure if you were sitting under it at night. <laughs> so trying to get that balance is the kind of thing Imaginary Forces does pretty well. And so these are films that they were commissioned to do. They did a, 10 films of really coarsely pixelated films. So each one of these cells between the blades has an addressable light which can change color and intensity. And these will be the films that will play on the, on the trellis. I, I mean, it, I don't know if it's relevant or not. Imaginary Forces really wanted to make this like a live feed representation of something. Like they were saying, well, you know, the reason it's all clouds in Dubai and stuff is they were saying, look, this should be based on the financial markets or how many people are awake in, you know, downtown and all kinds of ideas. And I was just like, can't you just design 10 beautiful movies that we know are gonna work? Um, so, but anyway, it has potential to somehow maybe represent information, but I was more interested in how it would create a, you know, a double speed ambiance. Um, <clears throat> these are just the projections of those films onto a big model to just show how it changes. Um, I'm still not entirely happy with the skin. I, I think we're going to probably go to kind of plank skin rather than this diamond skin but just some views into the thing. Um, and that's it. Thanks. <laughs>